Welcome to Sugi Talks. Sugi Talks is a podcast where we explore the powerful stories behind our pocket for it. So far, we've planted 155 in 28 cities. From restoring desert forests in Rajasthan to bringing wild spaces back to cities like Beirut and London. Join us as we speak with our Sugi forest makers about how to build biodiversity, climate resilience, and well being using nature based solutions. As we say, if there was once a forest, we can bring it back. Make sure you like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts for more Sugi Talks. So for our very first episode, we'll meet James Godfrey Fawcett. James is our lead forest maker at Sugi. With almost 30 years of experience in horticulture, his speciality is in the integration of organic and biodynamic methods. James is a master of the Miyawaki method, and has a deep understanding of ancestral forests. He's planted 20 forests in the UK alone, including the UK and Europe's biggest Miyawaki forest. We'll be speaking to James about how exactly these pocket forests can help cities. So, let's get into it. So thank you, James, for taking the time out to speak to us. It's always so good to see you and speak to you. You're welcome. Lovely to be here. So I wanted to get stuck in. Where are you right now and what have you been up to? Because I know there's been some really interesting projects happening at Sugi. Yeah, sure. So so I'm currently at home in the UK, in the southwest of England, um, near Stonehenge, which is kind of a, where everybody knows in the world. But I've just been, I was just up in Scotland looking at a project, which is a nice little project. And then before that, we were in London. And then before that, we were in Phuket in Thailand. So like a good diverse mix of, of places at the moment. Can you talk to us a little bit about the London project? Because I think that one in particular does a good job in describing what Sugi does so well. Yeah, of course. It was at the um, Hayward Gallery in South Bank, London. And it was, a, it was a very unique project because it was in a concrete jungle. So it's this kind of like brutalist architecture that they've got there. There's no plants, it's just concrete. Um, and the concept was be, was to try and get a forest in there somehow, to get a pocket of forest. So we ended up, we had to actually remove all the paving. We had to dig out concrete and, and we planted on top of a bridge. So we had 60 centimetres of soil to work with. Um, huge um, restrictions and we had to crane everything in, but we got it done. It's a great little project. It's small, but again, it's like impactful. It's impactful for biodiversity based around almost like a little little woodland area, really, right in the centre of London. Yeah, and it's so needed there, so it's going to look stunning. I wanted to talk a little bit about what exactly we do at Sugi. So one of our main objectives is to help cities build climate resilience and well-being using nature-based solutions. How exactly can these pocket forests help cities? Yeah, of course. I, th I think it's interesting, you know, pocket forests, what we do, where you can make a huge difference, I think, is on biodiversity levels and also on a social level, how it actually in interacts and how it affects people. Um, and also there are other aspects like, you know, these, these forests, particularly as we build carbon in the soil, they're able to absorb a lot of water. They can, you know, one um, square metre can, can absorb 150 litres of, of water over over one hour. It's incredible um, that otherwise would end up, you know, causing floods and this type of thing. So the, the biodiversity is really important. Um, we lack, chronically lack biodiversity in urban areas. And if you think, if you just take it back to pollinators, you know, little bees, little pollinators, they'll, they'll fly for up to two and a half kilometres to go and forage to find food. So if you create a mass of pockets of forest across the city, then you are really are creating a corridor where, where pollinators can, can move around easily and, and actually sort of find havens. So I think A, the biodiversity factor, and then B, the social factor. It, it, it's just that interaction that, that nature has with people that it's so important. It's ancestral, it's in our genes. Um, if people are stressed, automatically they'll go outside and sit against a tree or or just take a big breath because they're outside and it's really important and again by having these these multiple little pockets across forests 
you're giving people who might not have the chance to interact with nature the the, the chance to just go and have a bit of peace to have a bit of um sensory experience you know the kind of sound of bird song or the sound of bees or the smell of blossom or the kind of rustle of leaves it, it all brings our stress levels down it doesn't take very long it's scientifically proven you know we'll absorb compounds into our blood bloodstream after 20 minutes of sitting in an area full of trees so i think those are the two main reasons um, that it's impactful and 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 obviously you know the denser areas there are areas where there's a lot of green in cities but but primarily if you can bring these areas a bit like the Hayward Gallery into areas where there's nothing um, it kind of just gives that that lease of life that that little burst of nature um, that's so important. Mm, I think it's easy for people to overlook the importance of these green spaces but the research is really interesting Recently, I read a study that said just access to green spaces encourages pro-social behaviours like compassion and empathy in communities. No, I was gonna say, it's, it's astonishing. And, and it's, you know, you it's not something you have to accept. Do you know what I mean? It's like, go for a walk in a forest and I would challenge you to not feel more relaxed by the time you come out of the forest, unless you get a, a phone call that stresses you or something. Um, you know, that atmosphere, those terpenes that, that you absorb, those nat- um, negative ions that... that you just absorb by breathing it has a a beneficial effect on your body it has a beneficial effect on your mind and your stress levels and 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 that's what nature does for us it heals us without us even knowing that it's healing us in terms of biodiversity what exactly does it mean in layman terms and why is it so important to reinstate it back into urban landscapes yeah absolutely so you know bio, um, biodiversity is biological diversity it's the diversity of, of the world that we live in and and i think we have to remember that just because if people live in cities you know there's the other there's the other side the unseen side there's there's the di- diversity the the biodiversity is there all around us, even if we don't see it. And they're trying to exist as well. Those animals, those organisms, those pollinators, those microbes, everything that's there, that, that if it wasn't there, you know, the cities would cease to exist. You know, if you didn't have your unseen fungi or unseen microbes, we'd be overrun with pathogens. Um, you know, literally our cities would become uh, places we wouldn't be able to live if we didn't have the pollinators again. You know, you have... London has 50 types of bee that live around London. I mean, you know, it's incredible. Just, I mean, I couldn't name 50 types of bee, but there's 50 types of bee that buzz around London, keeping London's trees in in flower and pollinating. Um, And it's vitally important. And and even the small wildlife that's there, it all has a role. So, and it all interacts, everything within um, biodiversity interacts, like there's knock-on effects. So we don't have one form of biodiversity, even the lowest levels like the microbes, the the fungi, everything's infected. We put ourselves at the top of the chain and and we'll be be affected by all the knock-on effects. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating to think about all the worlds existing in and amongst us. And the processes and services provided to us by biodiversity, they are relatively unknown. Massively so, yeah. You also once said where there are people, there was once a forest. I think it's easy to forget that our ancestral environment was amongst trees. It was in the forest. Why has nature been so overlooked within the design of cities? I think just just with kind of um, development, um, you know, we've gone through these stages of, of, of we're in a consumer materialistic environment. Um, you know, there's not much empathy or there wasn't much empathy for nature in, in, in a large scale. And it's kind of, you know, greed is, is a great thing. You know, cities expand through greed. Um, cities expand through financial systems. And nature was knocked to the bottom. But I think it's partly because everybody assumed nature would just always be there. You know, people always assume nature's going to be there, forests would be there, um, that it's never going to start disappearing and it's never going to have an impact. And I think now we're seeing the impact you know, like like the the swings of of climate change we're getting. You know, the these incredible temperatures, these incredible floods. Um, you know, drought and flood are two sides of the same coin. We get droughts because we have floods, 
and we have floods because we have droughts. And it's all because we've taken away the trees, we've taken away the vegetation, we've removed the carbon from our soil, which is what would normally deal with all of this. It would regulate it all. And, and by massively taking this away, um, we're, we're seeing these extremes that are probably only going to get worse. And so I think, you know, we, we've pushed and we've taken and we've tried to push nature out of cities. Um, it'll never happen. It, it's like nature will always reclaim. It's kind of whether we're around to see it or not. Um, so I think there's that tipping point now. I, th I think there's an awful lot of groundswell of, of people who who want to bring nature back into cities. I think the COVID pandemic was interesting. I think people, again, had a real desire for nature. Like, like, like there was mass panic. And the one thing people sought out was nature, was trees, was green spaces, was that was kind of in a way people trying to heal themselves, I think, by seeking something out that, that instinctively they, they didn't know they were seeking out. Um, and I think there is this groundswell now. And, and I think you just have to look at the reaction of projects we do. You know, you're planting a little forest, people stop and ask what you do, ask if they can be involved. You know, children want to come and run in them. There's, it's so strong. When, when when we do these little projects in cities. Mm -hmm. Do you think these projects trigger an, an innate curiosity and pull towards nature that maybe we've previously ignored or maybe not had the opportunity to indulge? I think so, I, I do. And I think, you know, with children, it's incredibly strong, um, that connection to nature. I mean, kind of everything we do is controlled um, ancestrally. Um, whether we kind of, you know, men are tunnel vision because they used to hunt, so their focus is on the animal. It's just, you know, it's the simple things like that. Children put things in their mouths because they're trying to build up their immune systems instinctively. And, you know, we tell children not to touch soil, not to put their hands in their mouth when we should be encouraging them to. Um, you know, all these things, we tell children not to cry when we should encourage them to cry because it's their body releasing the emotions that, that, that they need to anaesthetize. So all of this is within us. And I think absolutely when, when, when we see projects, people see projects going on and when they, when they see planting, they instinctively want to be involved because I think it's a way of, they feel they're connecting back to nature, but they're also making a difference. You know, everybody loves, everybody feels proud even if they plant one tree because they feel they've given back a little bit to the earth. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I felt that on a new level at the Hayward Gallery. It's such an iconic cultural institution in the heart of London where I live. So I couldn't help but think about the impact that it's going to have on the area and the people. You know, towards the end of the planting session, even though it was raining, I really got a sense of how empowered people felt and their playfulness. So I think that's what makes Sugi so unique. A hundred percent. And I think, you know, what's lovely is when we plant with people, when we plant with organizations, brands, and all these, these kind of really lovely companies who step up and, and, and back these projects, it's great. You know, they want to come back. They come and plant, they have a chat, but they all want to come back and be involved. It's not just a one-off thing. They want to come back and help with maintenance and visit the forest and, there is that excitement. I personally, like with all the ones I've done, I still get excited going back. It's kind of like visiting like relatives or, or, or children or something, because you go back and <laughs> you get the excitement of kind of seeing that little bit of growth and, and the vibrancy and everything. So I think it's lovely that they're there as, as, as you know, places we can visit, like you said, with our children or grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And speaking of family, has there been a particular project that you've been moved by or that you've had some sort of special connection to i think it's kind of hard isn't it because they're all so unique all the projects um that we do with sugi but i think the two at the moment that stand out for me was was um the wonder fruit forest we did in um in thailand in chomburi which was 1.6 hectare interactive forest for for a, a festival out there and that on so many levels was, was great. I mean, it, it's wonderful to have somebody have the vision to ask to create an interactive forest, because that's the whole concept of this, is people will come to this festival, they'll spend time in the forest, you know, stages will be built, 
music festivals will take place in the forest. We planted part of it as agroforestry so people can go in and pick fruit. They can go in and pick the right type of leaves, make a tea for themselves. So it's like highly interactive. Um, and I think that's a fantastic model for the future, like interactive forests. Let's not make them too hands off, like let's make them hands on. Um, so that one, yeah, that one was wonderful. And lovely people like the guys I planted with were just the most lovely sort of people. So that makes a strong difference. Perhaps the other one more, more close to home was was the first temperate rainforest that we did in Cornwall. So that was Coswick Law, which is about two years old now. And that was just, it was one of the first ones I did with Sugi, but it was with 400 children, which is kind of challenging, but amazing at the same time. Um, and definitely just on a side point, trees planted by children grow better. I've had this conversation with several people don't know why it's like a vibrational thing it's the kind of joy and the the hope and the happiness that children plant with i think the trees seem to pick up on it um and they always grow better trees planted by children there's some connection there so we had um in cornwall we had 400 children planting and they but they basically created their own rainforest you know this concept of temperate rainforests that we have rainforests in the uk um there's 1% left. They're the most at-risk forest biome in the world. Um, and once they're gone, they'll be gone. And so, again, we, it was taking these Cornish children. It was it was connecting them back to their, their um, ecological ancestry, explaining to them that this is their type of forest. You know, this was what would have grown there before their grandparents and their grandparents' grandparents were there. Um, and we modelled it on, on a little pocket of forest planted a scaffolding of a rainforest. Um, and obviously it rains a lot in Cornwall as well. So it's kind of, it's flourishing. So I think that that close to home was, was my, my favorite, the most interesting project. Yeah, it's such a brilliant project. And I think not a lot of people know that England has temperate rainforests. Yeah, exactly. We used to have like 20% of the UK, United Kingdom was, was, was temperate rainforest, which is bonkers, the whole of the West Coast. Um, and it's all gone through agriculture and e exploitation. And to think 90% of that left, like 99% has been destroyed. And they're so precious. They're like a treasure chest of of, of biodiversity, a treasure chest of, of medicinal um, purposes as well. You know, we don't realise this enough. We think it's the Amazon that contains, you know, all the healing elements, which it does, but we have them here. You know, we have lich and moss, liverwort all these types of things contain compounds that can heal that, that they're there and, and we walk amongst them without without really realizing that they're there i wanted to talk a little bit about the logistics of building these forests there's many moving parts like working with councils and locals what have you learned from the process in building them yeah basically what well, one thing i've learned from doing it is it's really hard to find sites <laughs> Like one of the things we do is like we're constantly banging our heads against the wall trying to find impactful sites. And I think that's the hardest aspect, which is kind of crazy. Where when you're giving a forest away, you think people would what would take it with open arms, but actually it's incredibly hard to to break into councils and, and, and allow them to plant. We have an amazing relationship with Dagenham and Barking, who who we've done, I'm not quite sure, I think it's about 10 projects with or something up there. Um, so we tend to work a lot with kind of private land, a bit like the Hayward Gallery, the Cadogan Estate, all of these types of, of um, organisations are a bit more open minded um, and give us access to land. And perhaps the hope is if the more that we do, the more people will see and perhaps councils will see and actually realise what an amazing, impactful thing and, and important thing it is that, that we need to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, the projects that we did with Barking and Dagenham, they're incredibly transformative for the communities there. So I think you're right. It's just about creating the movement beneath us to do more. Yeah, yeah I think movement's such a good word, isn't it? And we need to create that movement. And, and it, it's it's moving, like the rock's moving slowly, but but it is it is starting. And and there, there are no downsides. I mean, there really, there's no 
you can't find a downside with with what with what we're doing with these pockets of forest you know it's it's only beneficial to humanity and to nature and, and to ecology mm. now i know our miwaki forests are maintenance free after just two to three years but what about the early stages are there any issues that crop up like maintenance or general upkeep um no, I mean, there's the mundane things, like, like people taking their dogs in there, um, which, you know, is, is always a bit of a pain. People, like, weirdly, if they've walked the same route for 10 years, they'll still try and walk through the forest because they feel it's their right. It's kind of so strange. They won't deviate for five seconds. They'll still feel they have the right to walk through. Um, we've had very little problem with vandalism which is always an issue but we had fingers crossed we haven't had issues with that which is great rubbish i mean you know you get a bit of rubbish blowing in but apart from that no there's no real issues that have arisen that um that, that, that create a negative effect yeah it is actually quite interesting you would think in a big city there would be some sort of vandalism or maybe just people coming back from a night out going through but it's actually just people with their dogs. People with their dogs, yeah. I've yet to find someone asleep in one, <laughs> which is always... I'm sure we will. I'm sure we'll find someone asleep with a bottle of whiskey one day. Maybe, um, maybe. But then they're welcome to if they want, so... Might be nice and cosy. <laughs> no, it's just dog walkers, ironically. Typical. So in your idealistic view, what would a perfect city look like if we integrated nature the best way we could? I think, yeah, I think the whole kind of biophilic route is 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 the route forward you know i always think if you look at london there's yet there aren't any rooftop forests you know we have how many hectares of rooftops do we have um you know all of those or some of those could be turned into forests they could be turned into wildflower meadows they they, they could be amazing biodiversity corridors because you could take insects pollinators above the bustle of the street and and they could move freely almost like a kind of a lair to themselves above cities it would be an incredible concept how we could move things on to create a lair that's just for biodiversity on rooftops so i think that has to be the future because there's only a certain amount particularly in central cities of available land you know you're never going to be able to take buildings out to put forest in because it's just not financially viable so I think that concept of, of being innovative, putting them on rooftops, putting them in patios, you know, greening up buildings, create, you know, walls that are breathing, that, that, that are emitting oxygen, that are cooling cities is the way forward. And I think as well, particularly with the climate change that we have, we need to get rid of grass. You know, grass is a monoculture. It, it, it doesn't really support much biodiversity. It takes irrigation. We should be turning parks in, into rewilded areas, you know, forests, wildflower meadows with paths. Anything like this is is how we should develop our cities. And and it's, you know, it's not hard. It's not, not hard to do. Mm. And how far away do you think we are from taking this seriously as a society? Miles away, I think. The, the only, to be honest, the only way it will happen en masse if, it, if there's a financial benefit. It's, you know, the it's like the concept of, carbon credits mm -hmm. gets people planting trees those people wouldn't those organizations wouldn't plant trees unless they got a carbon credit so if we can find a way that it's financially viable or, or it's beneficial in some way or it's legal i mean you know if, if we have a rule where x amount of square meters of, of your property has to be green has to be vegetation has to be planted to trees for example that's the way forward that type of thing's possible um but it kind of like it's up to governments really to bring in these rules to bring in these percentages and, and force organizations to actually back projects like this mm. and is there any cities that are experimenting or pushing the boundaries on this kind of thing that you find inspiring or that we should take notice of yeah definitely i mean like paris is a good one Paris is pretty forward thinking on this. They're, the whole area, as far as I'm aware, around the Champs Elysees and, and is going to be um, pedestrian only. And, and a lot of rewilding, like a huge amount of planting is going to be done in that area. 
um, and a lot of forest. And I think they'll even doing sort of micro forests like pocket forests as well. So um, Paris is a pretty good a pretty good example to follow. Yeah, it's interesting to see what is actually possible and what cities are doing. At the minute, we have forests in 28 cities. And by the time this podcast comes out, it could be much more. You know, I'm excited to see how far we can go. Massively so, yeah. We touched on this a little bit, but I think it's important to go back to it because it's fundamental to what Sugi does. We work with schools, we work with communities, we work with locals. Like, why is it important to involve people in the process of building these forests? And what's the impact? Yeah, I mean, we've worked with, with loads of children, haven't we? I think it's like 35, 40,000 children now. So um, it's incredibly important because I think children are, are really more aware than we give them credit for and they're aware of, of the issues you know climate change and, and what's going on around them and then particularly in other parts of the world and and the the natural instinct is to tell them to all oh, shush you know just shush go and go and burn your ipad or something but again they're aware of these problems and i think by getting them into what we do with sugi and other projects like that is it kind of gives the children a sense of hope. Um, and I think, you know, this energy of hope, such an important one, people aren't going to do anything unless they have hope. If you take hope away from people, they'll just bury their heads in the sand. Um, and I was talking to Elise about this, and I think what's really powerful is to give people hope and a solution. So you give them a bit of hope and you give them a bit of a solution, they, they can take a step and suddenly, you know, they feel a lot more positive about things. And I think with children, it's really important that we do that so we can bring children along. We can show them that, that there are solutions. We can show them that they can actually themselves, you know, plant a tree. Often children have never planted trees um, and that they can have a, a direct effect on, on their environment. And OK, it's small, but, but they go home having had a direct impact on, on their local environment. And, and it, I think it's just, it's incredibly important. It changes them. Um, you know, most kids that we have who come and plant, they'll run away saying it's the best day they've had. Um, you know, we've worked with schools in London. I mean, it's heartbreaking when the children come out and say they haven't been able to leave the school for two years because of the COVID pandemic. Like they hadn't been outside for two years. Within 10 minutes, they were throwing soil at each other and throwing worms at each other. And, and it's that blissful moment you get with kids. Um, and as I said, it helps the trees, but it also helps the, it helps the children. It really does connect ancestrally than something back to the, that they have a need for. And I just think if we give them a tiny bit of hope in their lives that they can impact, it's really important. Yeah, I think for people all ages, I think it's it's a really powerful thing. And I can certainly feel it from my perspective. Have you noticed, particularly in urban areas, a desire for people to want to get involved? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think communities take ownership of projects. I think what we often find is wherever you plant, there's often that the, there's two types of people. There's the one who walks past with a dog and goes, oh, they're all going to get stolen or die. I mean, you always get that that miserable person. But 99% of people are interested. They're, um, you know, excited about what's happened. And they actually embrace the um, concept of rewilding, which I think is quite interesting. Because, you know, by rewilding, the projects we do, it's not... It's it's re it's wildly beautiful, but it's not manicured, and you need to shift your mindset. But people do; they kind of it's really interesting. They love this concept of wildness um, and biodiversity. So I think yeah, it really really impacts communities in in a positive way. So we have one last question, and this is something we ask everyone, because. The way people approach it is so wildly different. And of course, their answers are very different. So what is one thing that nature has taught you? Um, I think it's a really good question, isn't it? Because there's so many answers you could give. Um, I think probably how insignificant I am or we are as humans. You know, we think we're the masters. When we're not, we're, we're, we're the learners. I think this is the big thing that I've learned is is 
really how, you know, if we disappear, it's for the best, for nature. Do you know what I mean? We think that we have to be here for the sake of nature. Um, and we can, you know, we can work in harmony and be guardians of nature, but we need to shift the way we think. So I think that is, is how insignificant we are, but also how amazing nature is. I mean, we just scratching the, scratching the lid of, of the incredible complexities that go on. We just, we just don't realize, you know, you couldn't make soil, for example, with all the technology we have, you can't make soil. Soil is something nature makes for us. Um, you know, all the interactions of microbes that go on, we can't create that. It's, it's done for us. So, and even the interaction of trees, you know, we're still learning how forests and trees work and, 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 and how the, you know, the crucial way trees photosynthesize and, and, and create all life, basically. So I think that kind of humbleness that, that we should have when, when we look to nature is, is perhaps the one thing I've learned. So thank you so much for joining us, James. It's always such a pleasure to talk to you. Oh, thanks, Anya. No, it's been lovely. Thank you so much. So if you enjoyed this episode of Sugi Talks, make sure you like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts to support more. Next time on Sugi Talks, we'll meet Gaurav Jigar, our Indian forest maker in Rajasthan. And he's got some pretty interesting projects happening, so don't miss that one. <laughs>